Hi everyone. Welcome to this third video in this video in the series Getting Started at Flexible Blended Teaching. This is where you may have to during COVID and maybe beyond deal with students that are both on campus or off campus. This particular video is on providing content. Okay, now the first simple way I'm going to suggest to provide content is to record your lectures. Okay, a lot of people don't approve of lectures or just recording lectures, but it is a pretty simple way and I think this way you will get great bang for your buck, get real impact for your effort. The type of tools that you would use these are, would generally be called screen capture tools, uh, like Camtasia, Screencastify, Screencast-O-Matic, but a lot of people are now using uh, conferencing tools like Zoom, Adobe Connect, Microsoft Teams, also to record as well. Uh, you can also use specialist tools like a panopto that, that are lecture capture tools okay um, i would i mean as i say some people think the idea of a long lecture is not, recording a long lecture is not a good idea and research seems to sh show that chunking it down smaller and that's why these videos are being chunked down smaller by the way uh, is a better option and i would agree with that but it is more work so i would say a good place to start is to record full lectures if you decide then that you get good at the whole process you may want to do it in smaller chunks okay now the skills you will need for this are well the first one i would say is good powerpoint practice a lot of people are using powerpoint it is quite a powerful tool if used well. I know a lot of people complain about it and that's what I'd say is the problem isn't with PowerPoint, it's how it would use. So I've got a separate slide on good PowerPoint practice. Okay, the other skills you'll have to learn how to use is how to record the audio, how to record your webcam, uh, how to share any applications on the screen if you want to do some demonstrations about how to use a particular website or a particular package like AutoCAD or Sage Accounting. Okay, and how to find out where the recording is and to publish it online. Okay, or put it somewhere on the web where it can be viewed. And then you may need to get a link to that and put that into your virtual learning environment in the correct location, maybe in the correct week or whatever. Other things as well, people mightn't use PowerPoint in their regular classes. They might like to write on the board. Okay, so sketching and writing is a skill that may be worth you getting. It can also be helpful to have a second screen when doing recording. You can um, you can keep you can record one screen uh, and then you can keep other materials off on the other screen just to have them ready when you need them and pull them onto the screen that you're recording. Now I didn't mention sketching and writing so I just want to show you uh, a couple of uh, items here. This first item here is a document camera and you often see these in classrooms where you can either put paper underneath and write it and this will show up on your computer screen and then then because your computer screen is projected onto the wall in the classroom it, it can be seen by the students in the classroom now but this in the same way if you have that on your computer screen and you're sharing your computer screen if you're doing a recording or even broadcasting to students if you're writing on the paper they can see what's on your screen so that is a good way if you like to write or sketch as part of your uh, of your teaching technique possibly an even simpler way is to have a chalkboard uh, within your camera view and then you can just write on that as well. Um, I would say in the past we've tried to do this with whiteboards but there tends to be a lot of problems with reflection and shine off it and the whiteboard markers tend to have a very thin line. Uh, you can get thicker ones so in a way I find chalkboards the best myself. I would say the document camera might well be one of the best solutions. Now you can get graphics screen as well where you can write on the graphics screen but generally it takes a certain amount of skill uh, in using your hand and the precision isn't isn't quite as good. Now one thing I would say about recording and this is one of the uh, practices I think I'm definitely uh, practicing in this set of videos is perfection is the enemy of the good. I've decided in this small set of videos that I will just record them once and go on. I will leave the errors in them and to be honest with you that is the only way to control your workload. There's lots of mistakes in these videos. I say I'm not quite sure what I'm going to say something like that but to be honest with you, it does sort of make it more like a live presentation as well, if you get comfortable uh, as you're recording. 
but certain and you do, and you don't have a script okay now you can script short videos but that's a huge amount of work so i would say don't be a perfectionist uh, prepare quite well okay get it down tolerate minor errors okay i said i was going to talk about good powerpoint practice uh don't bother trying to read that slide there but there would be some useful information it's a bit fuzzy uh, but hopefully uh, it's illustrating a point one of the things i should say about it is uh, don't put a lot of words on your slide and uh, that image is meant to illustrate that okay the less words you put on it is more uh, use maybe keywords or key phrases but the idea of the words on a powerpoint slide is just to draw the listener or viewers attention to an idea and to keep them concentrating on that idea and that to some extent is the idea of having an image on your slide as well you just want them to concentrate on an idea um, you can use the bullet bullet points I think are very good insofar as one thing uh, in that they remind you of what you're going to say you don't want to put a sentences up there and just read them you want to be somewhat spontaneous but the bullet points apart from drawing the listeners attention to what you're going to say they also prompt you uh, to what you're going to say next and if you know the material well or if you're fairly well prepared you'll be fairly good at using those bullet points uh, to prompt you on what you're going to say which is exactly what I'm doing now, by the way. Um, I would say use animation. Now, when I say animation in PowerPoint, I don't mean fancy graphics animation. I just mean the animation of bullet points. Now, there's a very good reason for this, is that if you put out a complete slide on the board, particularly with a lot of text in it, your viewers will start reading ahead. By the way, the same argument is made for not giving students or viewers your PowerPoint slides before a presentation. They may print them out, they may bring them up and start reading on to the next slide. You don't want them to do that. Use the animation so that they can't see the next point that's coming up. Okay, now that's fine. A lot of people say, why would you be doing recordings when there's so much good material out there? And I have to say, I largely agree with that, despite the fact that I'm making this recording here. But mind you, in this series of videos, I, will, I am going to use videos that either have I created, I have created in the past, or that I've, other people I know have created in the past or other people I don't know that I've created in the past. So there is great third-party content out there. Uh, why not go and see if you can find something that would save you from creating content? I've got a little uh, image of YouTube up there or YouTube for Education there. There's lots of good educational videos on YouTube. There are plenty of articles out there. There are plenty of useful websites out there. Okay, by the way, be a bit careful about pointing people to websites because there can be tons of material on it. They need some guidance on, as I've said in a previous video, guidance on what that material is for. A lot of it is free or open education resources, or it may be commercial. If it's commercial, there can be a bit of a challenge either in who's going to pay for this. Are you going to convince uh, management in your organization to pay for this student, for the students? Or are you going to ask the students to pay for it or require them to have access to that? Uh, simulated labs, um, I won't stop, about that, but in the same way that there's learning content there, there's lots of free simulations for laboratory work and paid for simulations as well. And that's a, that link there, bit.ly slash labs online, that's a link to a LinkedIn group that I've created about three years ago. There's a, there was about 250 people on that that are interested in labs online. You get information on that there. What's wrong with books? Books are really excellent resources. Uh, you can do flipped classrooms with books by asking them to read a chapter uh, before coming to class. A lot of them have added electronic materials. Now, in the past, we have required students to get books. Uh, there is a danger, though, that you ask them. A lot of students just don't bother getting the books. But if you're using a flipped classroom, you have to be pretty sure that they have them, that they have access to them. By the way, a lot of them do have electronic materials, either maybe videos or other augmented materials that go with each chapter. But what can be very useful to people is that a lot of these uh, books have quizzes with them. So it means you don't have to create quizzes to test them. And quizzes can be, it can be a bit of work. You know, okay. So, what skills do you need to provide third-party content for your students? Well, you probably need to get good at searching. It's very hard to train people on good at, good at searching. You know, you get into Google, you go into YouTube, uh, you start thinking up of keywords, key phrases, um, and searching, and you will get better at it. So, you need to 
practice and get better at finding good content. By the way, it's also you could get into groups on the internet, like on LinkedIn, people with similar interests yourself, and ask those for help, like our Labs Online group up there. Okay, You'll need to figure out how to identify the link or the address, the web address of some external content. Copy that and bring it into your um, uh, you are, bring it into your virtual learning environment and find the appropriate place and post that link there for the students. And you should be posting guidance on the use of that external content to the students as well. And perhaps access instructions, maybe they have to register for it. Okay, maybe it's a, a, a free course online and you want them to register it, but you only want them to do section three and section five or something like that. So give them good, precise guidance on how to use the materials you provide. Okay, now don't forget your old handouts. Maybe have those 25-year-old uh, handouts on paper with the dog ears, uh, but I'm sure you have them scanned long ago or in some sort of PDF format or Word or something like that. These can be useful as uh, learning uh, objects, I suppose, for your students as well. Uh, uh, what skills do you need? Well, if they are on paper, you may need to learn to scan. But if once they're in electronic form, you just need to learn to upload them into the virtual learning environment. Now, if you keep a document that changes from time to time, often putting them up into learning, uh, the virtual learning environment or learning management system is a bit tedious because every time you make a change, you've got to get rid of the old one and put up a new one. So what I often do is I keep a lot of my documents in Google Drive, okay? And uh, then I create a link to the document and I take that link and I put it in the virtual learning environment. Now, if I go back at any point and change the document, the link will always link to the latest document. Another place that people might put this is in Dropbox or maybe in Office 365, whatever. But you put it somewhere where you can edit it and the link always goes to the latest version. Intellectual property? Well, I think we're a little too uptight about intellectual property. Uh, people are not coming down hard on academics for what would be called fair use of other people's materials. Don't try not to steal wholesale. Also, if that material is available on another website completely legally, just point the students to the other website. Don't be making copies and putting it up on your site. And don't be... Uh, don't be, certainly don't be pretending that it's yours, copying it and putting it into your own document. Uh, but other than that, don't worry about it too much. And I wouldn't advise you to go get legal advice. You'll just be forever. Just be sensible about it. Okay, and that's the, this, the end of this section on providing content. The next video will be on facilitating a tutorial for your studios. Thank you.